there's two questions here. So we're going to say, we're going to answer the first question. We're going to put it back in the box. And if it gets pulled, we didn't want to answer the second question. So the answer to that, so, it, so, so questions are great, and, and, and especially when they're written down like this, because the question is based on an assumption. You're assuming that something is true, so therefore you ask the question, and the problem here is that the question is based on a false assumption. Now Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 12, wherefore if by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, after that all have sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Now, this, this verse is going to answer the question, okay? Verse 14, pay careful attention. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And then it continues. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come? Now, was Moses before Noah or after Noah? After. Anybody can speak up. After. After. So why did, why did Moses die? According to verse 12, why did anybody die? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For wages of sin is death. So, so nobody was born under Noah's righteousness. God said Noah was righteous. He was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was made just because he trusted in what God told him to do. Amen. And you can be made just tonight and have your sins forgiven tonight if you'll trust in Jesus Amen. Christ like God has told you to do. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's take a slightly different tack on this thing. All right. The question is, if all the people that were born between Adam and Noah were killed in the flood, we were born under Noah's righteousness, not Adam's sin. Okay? Did everybody understand the question? All right. What was Noah's righteousness? Right. What was the righteousness? Well, he trusted God, right? It was faith. He simply did what God said. But now, now, you are well past the flood. You've got a Bible open to Romans chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 21, just to cut down to the quick of this thing. Look at this. But now, now, present tense, the moment in the moment in which you and I are living, okay, right now. Not Noah, not Adam, not Moses, today. Look, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What righteousness is that? Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God. I think the righteousness of God supersedes Noah's righteousness. Okay? All right, look at that. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, and it's not even your faith, yeah. the faith of Jesus Christ. How about that? Now look, the righteousness of um, uh, I'm sorry, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, <laughs> unto all, and upon all them that believe. How I mean, how simple? How absolutely simple? How, how free? Hey, you all understand exactly what I just said. You all understand it. There's nothing complicated about what I just said. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Well, there is no difference. For all, Adam, Noah, Moses, all the way on to you and I today. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified. Now there's where there's where you lack. You have not yet been justified if you've not put your faith, if you've not done well exactly what Noah did. Simply believe. That's what faith is. All right. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, who uh, who got a put put forth to be a propitiation, substitutionary sacrifice, if you will, through faith. In his blood. Now look at this. To declare. What does it mean to declare it? Right, to announce, to proclaim, to manifest. Exactly right. To demonstrate, uh, to commend, to prove. Right? To, uh, to declare his, his righteousness. That's God's righteousness. It was manifested in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ by everything he did. 
his entire life. Now look, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sin. That's the forgiveness, that's the putting away, that's the pardoning of your sin, that our past, the forbearance of God, I declare, uh, I'm sorry, to declare I say at this time, his righteousness. Not we all is. His righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. How's that for simple? Amen. Amen.
Okay, I pulled this card again. The second question on here, Noah, Adam, Abraham, were they Jew or Christian? <coughs> First Corinthians 10.32 and Genesis 10.5. <coughs> Corinthians 10 32, Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. Okay, let's try to give an answer to that question. Well, there's a lot of questions here tonight. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, let's read it. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. We got three groups of people in the whole world, a lot of nations. But three groups of people that God classifies as three groups of people. And so I'm going to go with God. I'm not going to go with how man wants to judge the world. I'm going to go with God. God says there's three groups. There's three, there's three groups. So is Noah, a Adam, and Abraham, were they Jews or, or Christians? We're missing one group, aren't we? In the question right there. Gentiles, right? Go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. Yeah. Actually, I'll read a little bit back. We'll start in verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were the sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. I, I probably didn't say none of those names. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarmah. And the sons of Jabin, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kidim, and Dadanim. By these were the isles of the what? Gentiles. Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Everybody before that was a Gentile. But I'm going to include Adam, would it not? And um, anything after that still would be a Gentile until God chose Abraham. And that's where the transition starts. Okay. Hopefully that may have shed some. Just kind of pick up where he left off. So, were the Jew or Christian? Christianity did not come about until Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And with respect to you're either a Jew or a Gentile. Anybody Jewish here tonight? Okay, so you're all Gentiles if you're not a Jew. You're all Gentiles. We up here. We have. Jewish brother, we have everyone else Gentile up here, but we make up that third that third uh, group there. That's the church, the body of Christ. What what's the uh, common denominator? It's our faith in Jesus Christ is our belief. So again, the Christians Christianity had not been invented until Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, and those that put their faith and trust in Him, those became Christians, whether Jew or Gentile. It really doesn't matter what your natural birth is. It's what your second birth is. That's why it's called born again. If you um, I'm gonna read one verse. <coughs> as many as received him who is that Jesus Christ to him he gave, gave he power to become the sons of God That's a, I'm born into a new family I'm born into God's family not by my power, not by my work but by the power he gave me the power to become a son of God and the verse finishes even to them that believe on his name again we've gone full circle it's all about Jesus it's not about where you're born. It's not about what color you are. It's about what you choose to do for eternity. Are those who die in infancy saved? And why does not God always heal the sick? Now, there's another question here. I'm going to put it back in. Let's prepare. To be fair.
All right, let's get uh, two places in the Bible. Romans chapter 7. And uh, if you guys would, you know, there's rules here. You should be respectful. Remove your head coverings. You know that's a rule here. Come on now, guys. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter number 7. The Bible says... Seven, let's go verse number seven. <coughs> what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. <coughs> Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law <coughs> had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I, this is, this is Paul writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. You see that? So Paul was alive at one point in time in his life. At another point later, the commandment came. He understood right from wrong, and what happened? Sin killed him. He was, he was dead, dead, as far as the Bible says, dead in trespasses and sin. He's going to end up in hell if he died in that condition. Now, a child, does a child understand that? A baby, an infant, an infant doesn't have that. Right? They're alive without the law. And we see that manifested in uh, 2 Samuel. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 12. And if you didn't know this about David, David committed adultery. But he's going to have a child out of wedlock. It's not a bad word. It's called a bastard. And God was not going to allow a bastard child to sit upon the throne of Israel. What chapter was that? Se Second Samuel chapter 12. Where we bring reproach upon the name of a holy God. The holy God. Right. He's righteous. And uh, that child was going to die. That child was sick. And God told David that. Now verse 19. 2 Samuel 12, verse number 19. And when David saw that his servants whispered. Well, let's go back a little bit. I'm, I'm ahead of myself here. Verse 17. Now 16. David therefore besought God for the child. The child's sick. David's crying out to God. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. David's seeking God, asking God to take this away and not to let that child die. Verse number 17, and the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day, that's impressive, he hadn't eaten anything for seven days because he really cares about this child. On the seventh day that the child died, and him and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? So they think, man, David's been this bad with the child sick. How much worse is he going to be when he finds out the child is dead? Now, David sees this. David overhears this. Uh, verse number 19. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Verse 20, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. So, man, that's a change. What happened? Verse 21, Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was yet uh, while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Look what he says. I shall go to him 
but he shall not return to me. Now, if you didn't know this, the Bible says that God had given David sure mercy. He's got a house forever. And God said that for David. Now, even in the chapter before that, God said to David, the Lord has put away thy sin. David's sin was put away because David repented. David cried out to God and asked for forgiveness, asked for mercy. You can see that in the book of Psalms. So David went to be with the Lord. He's with the Lord right now. And that child's with David. That's what we see in the scripture. So I hope that helps. I will put it back in there for the other question. Can God and science coexist? Oh, yeah. That's a very good question. Everybody wants to look at the light. Uh, science and God exist. They're coexisting. That's an easy answer. I know you didn't want that easy of an answer. We've got a lot of people that talk to us. They want to try and razz us. You know, we're out on the street with people and try to tell us how great science is. And, you know, they, they look at a Christian and say, you know, you don't, they assume we don't believe in science. And I say, look, I'd be an idiot and not believe in science. I'd rather talk about it. Science did that. But let me tell you something. Guess, guess who gave those engineers the brain to create those automobiles? The creator. Okay? Without the creator, I couldn't take my next step. Okay? I need everything that God provides me, so do you. And guess what? God has made, God has given some men some some fabulous brain work, you know, up in that brain housing group of theirs. So, yes, we believe science and God coexist. Now, I think maybe you really want to know is does this, this science contradict the Bible, perhaps? Well, the science doesn't contradict the Bible. They, people want to try and contradict the Bible. People want to try and prove the Bible wrong, and they want to say, see what science did? God had nothing to do with it. Look, the Bible tells us that God created all things. Did God create that light bulb? No, we're not idiots. God created all things that were put on this earth. All the elements it takes to make the, the tungsten and what or whatever else is in that light bulb and the sand that made the glass and all the other, everything out there. God created all that. God created the first human beings that were on this planet. And from then, from there, God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And they've done that. And so there's a lot of things that, that man has done, but nothing compared to what God has done. Amen. Just to add on to that, that was really good. Can God and science coexist? And again, uh, the question uh, is more directed towards a battle between faith and, and observable science. And um, science is not a worldview, as many would assume it is. You know, I believe in science versus you guys that believe in invisible sky dad. That's what I get when I go to the University of Central Florida. These are the kind of arguments we get all the time. But um, it's basically a naturalism versus Christianity. It would be a logical fallacy to say, I believe in science versus someone that, that believes in God. Science is a process that assumes absolute laws in this world, the law of uniformity in nature or induction, gravity. But using this method is a Christian worldview concept. In order to do science successfully, you have to, you have to acknowledge there are absolute laws that go beyond the natural realm. There are supernatural laws that hold that hold true every day. They don't change. Like one day, you know, there, that piano right there is going to be a piano, and then, and then tomorrow it's going to be a cow. You can rely on the uniformity of nature because God made it that way. And all these laws are play, are in the Bible. Say that that's how God created it. The way the world is today and our understanding of how we assume the world is today. God has placed that in there. Okay, so hopefully that may have helped. All right, so in Daniel chapter 1, so if you have a Bible, you want to turn there. Uh, the Jews are God's people, right? 
God shows the nation. I mean, Brother Ed did an excellent job of, of explaining the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God, right? And, and also in Ephesians chapter 2, just to add to that since I'm here, and, 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 I, and I guess I can. It says, in times past, you were Gentiles. But then you trusted in Jesus Christ became part of the church of God. But what we're going to look at real quick are the Jews who have been taken into captivity into Babylon. Everybody know that story? Most of you, some of you. So in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, under Jerusalem, and besieged it. Now, why did he do that? Why we've got, you know, these are God's chosen people. Surely they can they can defend off a Gentile king, right? Or read verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. So God God sent Jeremiah to the nation, the nation of Judah, and he said, an army's coming from the north. You need to give yourself over to him. Now, you go and tell a king that, you go and tell the king's people that, they're going to look at you like you're a traitor. And that's exactly how they looked at Jeremiah. He had a pretty rough ministry because of that. But they, 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 God told them, I want you to submit yourself to Nebuchadnezzar. You've not been doing what I asked you to do. You've not been living the way I asked you to live. You have not obeyed my commands. You have not kept me first. You have not kept my Sabbath. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. You've disobeyed the word of God. Now, now, now you've been weighed in the balance. You're going into captivity. And you can either submit yourself willfully or I will allow Nebuchadnezzar to come down and take you. They did not submit. Nebuchadnezzar took them. Now what I want you to look at though is in verse 4. You might be asking what in the world does this have to do with it with, with, with the question. Children who, so, so, so the king is one, he's wanting to grab the best of the best people. All right, so the king goes, and you know what kings do, that I want all the pretty women, I want all the money, and I want the best of their scientists, I want the best of their, 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 their uh, advisors, whoever the best of those people are, that's who I want in my house. And we're going to retrain them, we're going to teach, teach them to be Babylonians so that we can use them. Now again, this is God's people, right, the Jews. All right, verse 4. The king's calling these people to him, and uh, he says, The children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, and skillful in wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science. These are God's people. And, and, and the king understood that when he took these people into captivity, God's people had, had groups within them that had cut, they were cunning, they were knowledgeable, and they had understanding of science. So, so the, the issue is, so, so again, remember when I, when I first got up and answered the question, I said questions are based upon false assumptions often. You can tell the premise of the question based on the assumption. What the question is asking is essentially is about evolution. Did you know that since its inception until today, it's still called the theory of evolution? Do you know why this wall stands? It's because science is provable, it's observable, you can see it, you can reproduce it. That wall will not come down because actual science was used to produce it. Show me a monkey to turn into a man. Is that observable? Show, show me a rock that turned into a living creature that then, that then turned into a fish that then turned into a lizard that then turned into a bird which then turned into a, a monkey which turned into a man. Okay, has anybody ever observed that? Now, you might believe that. And this is the crux of the issue. This is the best part of the whole thing. This is, this is, what, this is the part we love about it. They make fun of us and say that we, we're, we're ignorant people that have blind faith. It takes a lot more faith to believe that a monkey turned into a man than it does to believe that there's a creator that created all things. Now turn to, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. So that, 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 that sums up, this, this list will sum up the, the other half of the, the false assumption. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, let me turn the right place. Yeah, verse 20. All right, so... 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul's talking to Timothy again. We, we like to go there. We've been there several times tonight, right? Paul was a wise man. You know why Paul was wise? He believed in God. He trusted in God. God used him mightily. You know why Timothy was a wise man? He followed Paul as he followed Christ. And what we're here to encourage you to do tonight is to follow us as we follow Christ. We want to point you to Jesus Christ. All right, so verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. All right, now, he, now, now, Brother Mike read to you a minute ago that Timothy has known the scriptures since a child, mm -hmm. and they made him wise unto salvation, correct? Mm -hmm. And then Paul told him, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, <coughs> said that, that, that scripture is, is that there's a lot of use for scripture. That's the other question that, that, that we had. Now he's telling them, I want you to keep these things, right? 
Old Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding pra uh, profane and vain babblings. Would you say that's a good thing to avoid? Yeah. What does that mean, babblings? Uh, a lot of things come into your head right now, right? Yeah. Just, just, just babbling. Don't even <coughs> explain it. You know what it is just, just by the word itself. Now, if you would avoid babblings and you would avoid profanity, right, to be right with God, would you not also want to avoid the rest of this verse? <coughs> so avoid, uh, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions to science <coughs> falsely so called. So there is science, correct? Remember, the, the wall, the piano. I'm speaking to you through a microphone right now. You hear my voice? That's because someone with understanding who was cunning, who had knowledge and had understanding of science, produced something that could, they could amplify my voice so that you could hear it. But they can't produce a monkey that turned into a man. All right, there, there's a difference. That's science falsely so-called, and God, God has no problem with science. As a matter of fact, people come to me all the time. There's a guy at work, I witness to him all the time. He's an atheist, believes in science, reads about science, all that good stuff, and he says, what would you do if they could scientifically prove to you something in the Bible is correct? I said, I'd wait. Just give it a few more years. Because that science book is going to change. And, nine, and, and every single time, ten times out of ten, science catches up with the Bible. The Bible has never been corrected by science. There might be things in here you haven't proven, you know, disproven. or, or that you, will, you will never disprove the Bible. It will always prove to be correct every single time. Just give it enough time. Amen. Oh, hold on for a second. Look, if you're still looking there, look at verse 21. <coughs> See, it's a warning. It says, with some, talking about those that profess science, with some professing have erred. They made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> erred concerning the faith. They replaced their faith in a invisible God, but nonetheless a God that has left multiple evidences yeah. for you to be able to place your faith and hang it on something <coughs> concrete. Yeah. But what has happened? Science has tried to displace <coughs> and dispel the truth of the, of the Bible and your faith that you anchor in the word, and it tried to supplant that and put science, falsely so-called, because true science is reprovable. Evolution is not, never has been. So again, please, the, the, the issue is don't be don't be confused. Uh, and don't be don't be allowed, don't allow yourself to be uh, to accept a counterfeit. Science tries to counterfeit the Bible. It says you know, uh, which having uh, which some professing putting their faith in science have erred concerning the faith. You got the faith. Don't give it up for something called science. Amen. Falsely, falsely called science. Amen. It will fail you. It will fail you. Yes, share the wording, but we try to read it the right way. Um, do you think that your God loves black people? Why are we always the bad ones? Now, this, this question did not come from us. Um, first off, if you're if you're black or night, you didn't choose that. I didn't choose to be white, but you can choose where you're going to spend eternity. If you're black or night, a white guy gave you the gospel. <laughs> because God loves you. Because God loves you. As far as the other half of the question, why are we always the bad ones? The Bible says for all of sin. Yeah. For all have sin. Yeah. Um, there is there is none good. No, not one. For all bad. So and, and the, that's the problem we have in modern America and all over the world. My, my, my brother here just came from Sierra Leone, which he would go to some village, and he was the only white guy. God, God <laughs> sent, that God sent him there because God loves everybody. Amen. 
It's not about your color. It's not about your, your it's not about who where you were born. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all men because all have sinned and all have fallen short. Uh, if you have a question, we'll be glad to answer it afterwards, but we don't want to turn this turn into a debate. Um, but God God sent his son for all men. Does anybody else want to handle that too? That's a that's a good question for, for this day and age in our culture here in America. Um, but I, I wouldn't see some of that kind of happening around other parts of the world. As it's our culture, we're so ingrained in this culture, we get desensitized to a lot of things that are moral concerning the Word of God. Because how many of reading the Bible nowadays? Everybody's too busy watching the news and watching a bunch of reprobates try to teach you some morality off the, off the media. You need to get in your Bible. That's what you need to do. Get in your Bible and you see how God sees humanity, not just a certain group of people. That's why you end up in all these cults and false doctrines that are out there right now. That's why it's so rampant in this country. It's because people aren't actually reading their Bible. We got this lazy culture where you get on the Internet and you can just pretty much have this lifted cup of Christianity. Because I don't have to study anything, so it doesn't matter. I'll just go on a website and just see what this guy says. Hey, this guy's the same color of skin in me. Well, what does he say? Hey, this guy has the same bald head that I do. What does he What does he say? Come on, guys. Really? you got to go to the Bible, the Word of God. It takes study. Now, the Bible says, and, and Mike so graciously mentioned this earlier, but God loves everyone. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. What does whosoever mean? It's not, it's not a trick. You don't need to go to the Greek to find out who, what whosoever means. Okay? It's anybody, anybody. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a condition there. If you believe, the condition isn't the color of your skin. The condition is if you believe. And it's whosoever, meaning any color of skin. If you believe on Jesus Christ, the condition is believing and you have eternal life. But the negative aspect is it's a twofold promise. It's a promise of eternal life if you believe. But what happens if you don't believe? Well, you're going to perish. John 3, 16. And it doesn't say only Indians are going to perish. It doesn't say only black people are going to perish. It says whoever doesn't believe. How can you confuse that unless you read into the text something it doesn't say? Now, uh, go to Galatians 3. Go to Galatians 3, 28. The Bible says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. We mentioned there's three groups of people in the world. See, we're already reiterating things we already mentioned earlier tonight. See how it all starts connecting now. There's three groups of people in the world, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, Jew, Gentile, Church of God. The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek. So we're talking about, you want to get saved to, be, to become church, Right? Well, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, except if you're black people. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You've got a cross-reference to that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Now, I want to reiterate that because sometimes you repeat something because people want, give me a second witness. Give me a second witness. So go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The only prerequisite for you to be in Christ is what I just said. To be part of the church, whether you're Jew or whether you're Greek, and that includes Indians, uh, people, probably colors of skin we don't even know exist in the world, but them too, every single human being out there that has the breath of life in their lungs, they need to believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose again the third day. And if you trust that and believe on that by faith, as we said earlier tonight, you have eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and reconciliation to God. Now, one more, one more, one more. Revelation 5 9. Let me give you one more. Revelation 5 9. Revelation 5 9. Go to Revelation 5 9. Now, there, I got two witnesses for this verse, too. 
we, we, we want to make sure we, that scripture backs up scripture. So your backup for Revelation 5.9 is Revelation 7.9. We're going to say the same thing. <laughs> Revelation 5.9, it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on earth. It didn't say only white people are going to reign. It didn't say only black people are going to reign. It says anybody that's believed on the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. God is an equal opportunity God. <laughs> Revelation 20:15 says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Yeah. Friend, whosoever means everybody. Yeah. So God is an equal opportunity God, Amen. and he'll throw a black man, a white man, a yellow man, uh, any other kind of man, whatever man, right in the hell, right in the lake of fire, no matter what. Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We're worried about race and color. Who cares? You better get saved. You better trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, you ain't making the trip, Jack. You ain't gonna see it. I'm here to tell you. I want to address one other part of this question that's a false notion that's taken by so many people. If you open up your Bible again, go to Romans chapter 3. You can look at Galatians chapter 3. I, I want to address this idea that somehow any one of us is good. Right. You understand what I'm right. saying? Yeah. I, I, I lived in a religion. I was a little goody two shoes. <laughs> I was a self righteous person that was in church since I was a little kid. And I lived in a way. I mean, you, have you ever read Philippians chapter 3? You want to know the <laughs> best man that ever lived? Do you know that? It was Paul. <coughs> and he said he counted all his righteousness but what? Yeah. Dumb. Amen. It's dumb. Yeah. Okay. okay, so so we got some black guy saying that we're bad. You are, you are bad, yeah. but she ain't any worse than me. I'm telling you today that we need a savior. Romans chapter three. With this 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 lines up with the idea of scriptural authority. This is the correction. Romans chapter three. Look at verse ten. There's this is in our opinion. As it is written. What? There is how many righteous? You see that? How many? None. Well, you guys are all good. There's none righteous. And, and, and just to answer your retort, but I, look what God says. There's none righteous, but I know what? Not one. Not one. At, look, there's none that understand it. Look, I thought that the Bible was wrong when I was lost right here. I knew this verse. I read this verse and it says... There's none that understand it. There's none that seek it. I was in church every week. But you know why I was there? I was looking for righteousness inside myself. I was looking for what I could do to get to God. The churches are saying, do this, do this. You're a good person. Just keep coming back and give us your money and the rest of this stuff. And the fact of the matter is, is that there isn't anybody that's good. You can pick the Pope, you can pick the President, you can pick a Baptist preacher or somebody in a rescue mission. I don't care where you come from, the Bible says you're not good, you're just like me. You don't understand and you're not seeking God, you're seeking righteousness. Is what, that's why people go to church. But look at the next verse. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that do it good. That's why Jesus came. <laughs> he came and died on that cross. Did you know that it says that? The Bible says that he was made our sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in who? Him. Him. 
I'm telling you, you can have the righteousness. You can, if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to be righteous as God is righteous. And the only way you're going to get that is if you get in Christ. We're kind of laboring this one question, but let me just, I think there might be a little bit of confusion left. <coughs> Whether there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female. Now think about that. Are there women in this world? Yeah, there's some right back there. Are there men in this world? Yeah, I think there are. So what kind of differences are they talking about? They're not physical differences. So black, white, <coughs> anything in between, that's not the differences we're talking about. Okay? So please, don't anybody be offended by that. Don't get anybody be confused about that. The issues at hand are spiritual, not physical. Okay? So... Look, very, very briefly, quickly, over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And it says this, verse 1. There is therefore now, again, present tense, there is therefore now no condemnation, no blame, no guilt, no accountability. It's been taken care of, not yeah. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. That's exactly what was just already read to you before. Uh, who walk not after the flesh, uh, not after the but after the spirit. Uh, down, in verse, uh, down in verse 9 it says, But ye are not in the flesh, no matter what color that flesh may be. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's being born again. Okay? Uh, if, uh, if so, you... Uh, if so, that be, I'm sorry, I can't read. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. That's the new birth. Dwell in you. Now, now, present tense, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That means you're lost. And again, that's been brought out uh, time and time again. It doesn't matter what, what your ethnicity is. How's that? Go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse, uh, chapter, yeah, Galatians chapter 4, look at real quickly, verse 6. I know we've taken a lot of time on this one particular question, but it must be, it must be important. So now look, look at verse 6. And because, uh, well, let's go back, let's go back to verse 4. But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son. What color was his son? Uh, sent forth his son. Made of a woman, made under the law. To do what? <coughs> to redeem them, you, me. To redeem us. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption. Anybody know what adoption is? Well, I've adopted some young, some children in Sierra Leone. Guess what? They don't look like me. They're a little darker than me. Okay? They're my sons. Now, this is exactly what Jesus Christ does. Now, look at this. And because ye are sons, how about that? Because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wow. Amen. That's nothing to do with color. That's nothing to do with ethnicity. That's nothing to do with anything but what's the condition of your heart. What's the condition of your heart? What do you put your faith in? Right? That's all it comes down to. Your faith, your trust, right? For making this thing. Okay. We only have a couple minutes left, so we're not going to try to go to our question. We did not get to your question tonight. I'm sorry. We tried to be um, equitable um, <coughs> randomly. Um, tonight, what we did is we opened God's Word and shared with you God's Word. And it seems like we're looking towards which Bible should I use, or which religion should I use, or which passion should I follow, or which color should I be, or, or looking towards science. I'm going to close in one verse, in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for, or you should be looking for something, that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, it came full circle. What you should be looking for is Jesus Christ. Looking 
to Jesus Christ. On that cross, Jesus Christ bled and suffered and died. There were two men on the cross beside him. <coughs> one looked to him. And one looked away from him. The one that looked to him is in, in heaven today. 2,000 years ago, he entered heaven. He entered eternity. The other one also entered eternity that same day. 2,000 years ago, he entered hell. Hell is not a joke. Hell is not a game. There is no time off for your behavior. There is no parole. Hell is eternal. You have an eternal soul inside of you. Your eternal soul is going to spend some place eternal. You need to be looking towards that blessed hope, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Steve, can you go ahead and close us in word? <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, we come before your throne, Lord, this evening. There is a full house here, Lord. For us, we come before your throne and we know you as our Lord, our Savior, our God, the object of our worship. Father, we want to live to be constantly in prayer, always before your throne. Lord, that we have no idea what their eternal condition is. Lord, I get to your question. I'm sorry. You're welcome to come up. We'll answer it now. Or if something said the next part of the question, please come up and talk to us. That's why we're here.